Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Ephesians chapter 6. Now we looked at the husband and wife, chapter 5. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. So we see the wife's conduct to the husband. We see the husband's conduct to the wife. We see the children's conduct to the parents. They are to obey their parents. Submission. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. All right, so are we void completely of the Ten Commandments? No. This commandment comes out of the Ten Commandments. And Paul illustrates to us that that commandment came with a promise. And the promise was long life. Listen, if you disobeyed your parents and you didn't do right and you were a glutton and you were a drunkard and all that, your mom and dad had a right in the Old Testament to bring you to the judges and you were stoned. And then the Bible also says if you curse your parents, you're going to die. And I know a few, I've heard illustrations of preachers who loved the Lord and done right. And even when they were lost, they didn't treat their parents right and they didn't live long. This is one of these, these commandments that falls in the Old and the New Testament, and the promise goes with it. You, you treat your parents right. You had longer life, and it's commanded, honor thy father and mother, that it may be well with thee, thou mayest live long on the earth. So see, it's long life. I believe, and you can take this and throw it in the garbage can, God has a set period for us to die. And whether here, whether we treat our parents right, whether we get involved with sin, I feel or believe with scripture that you can die before God wants you to die. By your actions, by your conduct, by your sin. Because right here it says, hey, listen, you can have life, but if you don't treat your parents right, you've lessened your life. And fathers, and ye fathers, provoke not your children wrath. Don't bring them up in hostility. Don't bring them up in anger. Don't bring them up so they're angry. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up in the Lord. Bring them up right. The Bible conducts us as parents how to raise our children. We're to raise them right. We're to raise them for the Lord. We're not, not the pastor, not the Sunday school teacher. They only get them like three hours a week. But as a father... No one says, it doesn't say anything about the mothers. It says fathers. The father's in charge of, of his children that, that he brought into this world. Servants. All right, now we're looking at employees. Wow, we're hitting everything. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, your employer, according to the flesh. All right, if you have an unsaved boss. You better be obedient to him. And Paul's already taken for the fact is probably 90% of Christians from the time that Christ rose from the grave from the Ethiopian eunuch to the rapture, 90% of the Christians are going to work for unsaved bosses. You might be good enough to have somebody in your church who's got a business and you work on them. Amen. But in the flesh, they're lost. Obey them. Like Romans 13. The government's not saved, but you obey them. That's a charge by God. According to the flesh, with fear and trembling. I'm going to lose my job if I don't do right. 
I'm not going to get a paycheck if I'm not going to do right. I won't be able to pay my bills if I don't do right. And God wants me to live right. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 1. In singleness of heart. In other words, don't be a, you know, a double employee. You're, you're great when the boss is around, and when he's not around, you're a rotten employee. Serve with your single heart to do that employer justice and good. As unto Christ. Well, look at that. As the husband and wife are like unto Christ, the, the, the bride of Christ, you're to serve your employer as you would serve Jesus Christ. And it's said already, in the flesh, you lost boss. How are we doing? Huh? We don't want to go to law like Galatians. Just forget the law. But now let's look at born-again Bible-believing Christians. And Paul writes to us, we're to have a specific conduct to our, our spouse. We're to have a specific con conduct to our parents. We're to have a specific conduct to our employer. How are we doing? Not with eye service. Oh, here, here he comes. Get to work. I remember one time, this was a while back, but in New York, the governor was walking around a, a government agency, and he caught someone playing uh, solitaire on their computer, and he fired him right there in the spot. And there was a big uproar. Oh, he shouldn't do that. Hey, listen, you're on your employer's time. You're supposed to be doing your employer's work. And it's not, oh, here comes the boss. Okay, get to work. Make it look good. All right, he's gone. Boss is taking a day off. All right. Yay. That's not the way it's supposed to be for Christians. As men pleasers, don't just be there just to please your boss. Be there to please Jesus Christ. But as the servants of Christ, see, you got a rotten job. You got a rotten boss. Say, Lord God, when you pray before you start work, before you leave to go to work, say, Lord, let me do it to your honor and glory. I had to put one particular place I hate working for, and I just gave God the glory and put it in the in the uh, GPS. Praise God for a job. Every time I set that that GPS, I knew where to go to work. And every time I would say, "You're about to praise the Lord," turn right, give it to the Lord. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God, the will of God is for you to treat your unsaved boss and his business right, as you were to treat Christ. From the heart. From the heart. Just like being saved, it's from the heart. Just don't do it. You know, I'm doing it because I have to do it. You're not going to get no credit. With good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. You're supposed to be going to work. You're supposed to be a hard worker because you are of Christ. Let God give you the promotions. Let God give you the credit. You just go there and do your employer a job, a service, a duty. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So rewards will come by our hard work. And ye masters, employers now. Now to the Christian employer. Do the same things unto them. Forbear threatening. Don't you threaten them. Don't you lean over them with, with austere I mean, uh, rigor like the Egyptians did with, the, with the Israel. You're not supposed to be threatening your employees, Christian. Knowing that your master, God, also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of persons with it. Don't re even if you got unsaved and Christians under your business, you treat them both right. You don't give that. You don't give your Christian brother more favor at the job place. That's not correct. You treat them all the same and all of them correctly. You're not going to win the guy to Christ if, if you mistreat him. You're not going to be a proper Christian if you show favoritism. Finally, my brethren, talking to saved people, the strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It's a warning. We're going to a warning now. Are you strong? Put on the whole armor of God. Don't nick and pick. Don't nick and choose. All of it. Entirely. 
Some just put on, oh, I got the sword of the King James Bible. You a prayer warrior? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Romans 13, 12. 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Job 41. We have an enemy. The world doesn't really believe in the devil or Satan. But guess what, Christian? There is one. And God has given you armor to fight the wiles of the devil. This is what this armor is for. You can't walk, oh, I'm going to get old smutty face with a water gun. There's no water gun here. You say, what are you talking about? I've heard a preacher say that. I'm going to shoot the devil with a water gun in hell. I don't see that here. Sorry. I don't see calling the devil names. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now this armor, we do have a problem with the flesh and spirit. And we have a problem with the spirit and flesh. They contradict each other. All right, besides that battle that we've already talked about, I believe it was Romans. Guess what other battle you have, Christian? You have Satan. To those that are strong, now this is not for a weak Christian because he won't, he won't put the armor on. He won't fight. But if you're going to stand up and all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You better know what your armor is. You better know how to put it on. You better know where it goes. You better know how it's used. You better know everything about it because Satan is on the attack. And let's see, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Again, we've already seen those principalities. They are the devil's domain in the heavenly places. Against powers. God has, I mean, God has powers. Satan has powers. There's powers all around. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world so there are leaderships of this world of this earth that are of satan satan came to jesus and said listen i'll give you all this if you fall down and worship me there are people in government positions today that told satan yeah i'll do it and they may be against christians they will work against christians they will try to fight christians and you got the armor you got powers and and principalities and humans this is why the armor is given. Uh, darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's above your head. That's Satan in his domain. That's the people that are under him. That's all the power he's given to his, to his angels. All the powers he's given to his devils. All the power he's given to men that will fall down and worship him. They are our enemies. Wherefore. All right, because of all these powers, because of Satan after you, wherefore take you the whole armor of God that's twice mentioned. Verily, verily. It's important. Paul wants you to know the whole armor of God. That's an important statement. It's repeated. That ye may be able to withstand the evil day. And look, it says, verse 11, the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand. And he says again, the whole armor that you may be able to withstand. When you got your armor on, you are standing. And standing, when you're in, a, this would be World War I, World War II. When you stood on the battlefield, man, you were a marked target. You were easy prey. But in the battle of Satan, in the battle of what God has given us, we are to stand. And guess what? When we take a stand, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You are asking for it. That's why a lot of will drop out. That's why a lot of will not stand the battle because they know it's a battle. And the armor is not good to wear. It's not comfortable. It's heavy. It's but God has given it to us, and God will reward us. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, his dying decree, I have finished, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my court. He has finished his fight. It's a fight. It's a battle. 
and that ye may be able to withstand that in that evil in the evil day. There's coming a day that listen, this wickedness is gonna happen to you. There's going to be an attack in that day. There's going to be Satan. There's going to be men of the world. They're going to you will have your day. And having done all, again, three times to stand. God doesn't want you to fall. Satan wants you to fall. We mentioned Genesis 3 as the fall of man. And yet God has given us equipment to stand and take a stand. And look again, verse 14, stand again. So do you know what God wants us to do? He wants us to stand. There are Christians up. They take a stand for America. They take a stand for gun control. They take a stand for abortion. They could take a stand for America, the flag. No. No. The stand that a Christian is for your armor against the battle of Satan. Therefore, having your loins, that's a vulnerable part of you. That's your midsection. That's your private area. Girt, let me see what I got to know here. Girt is to surround about with truth. Protect your belly, your, your midsection with truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. Have Jesus Christ. Thy word, sanctify him through thy word. Thy word is true. Have the Bible around your midsection protecting you. And have it on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, that righteousness, that is not an offensive war. That, that is a defensive. You use it when somebody is attacking you. Very rarely will you use it as an offensive weapon. And yet, if you have to use your shield of faith as offensive, do you realize how close that enemy is to you? He's within your arm shot. He's crept in. He's up, to, up, right up to you. Know how to defend yourself with faith. Know how, okay, if I do have to use this thing as offensive, know how to use your faith for that. Because Satan will attack your faith. I have been saved since 1987. I've read my Bible. I've been laying in bed. I'll be sitting. I'll be driving down the road. Whatever it is, whatever it's, this happens many times, and Satan will come up and say, do you really believe that Adam and Eve story? Do you know that the Chinese had the same same kind of story about a guy in a boat with all different animals? Do you know that this Roman goddess also progresses to be virgin born and gave birth to the, the, the savior of all the world? Do you really believe that that by and Satan will attack and that's where you gotta go in and that's where you gotta have the words of truth. That's where you gotta have the word of God. You gotta have the knowledge of the word of God. You gotta read and study and show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You gotta know and say, hey, faith and truth in your loins. So when you're holding that shield, guess what? There's faith protecting your upper body. What's underneath that field of shade? The truth, your loins being protected. Those two articles that you definitely need. And it's never compromised. And let's see what I got a note here. Exodus 28, 15. It's confessing. That, that breastplate. It protects your heart and your lungs. And probably goes about to your belly button. And the loins will be about your, your belly button down to your... Uh, your calves. So see, God has now protected your entire front. And yet there was one man who was out of the will of God in the Bible. I forget who he was. He was a king. And when somebody drew a venture to shoot the bow, it got him right between the harness. And see, God was his enemy. And the enemy shot the arrow. You, did, did, did that catch you somewhere? You would see the reference of the arrow being shot and the breastplate being on and God's directing that arrow to death. You got to be right. You got to be living right. You got to have your sins confessed. You got to be in this armor righteous before God. And then it will work to your full ability. It also goes on to say, and your feet. Your feet. You read Romans 10, 15 with this one. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. P 
peace. And again, Romans 10, 15. How beautiful are the feet of them that carry the gospel. You are to take your feet with that gospel. Street ministry, knocking on doors, passing out tracts, leaving tracts in the bathroom, taking them, going to somebody and talking about Jesus Christ. Your feet are to be with the gospel. Again, the word. The truth, girt the loins, it's truth, that's the word. The breastplate, righteousness, Jesus Christ is our righteousness. He's the word. And now we have the gospel. The gospel is the word. It's all the word. What do you do when you got a modern Bible who's not the word and it's been cut out in places? Can you imagine holding up a shield and it looks like Swiss cheese? That ain't going to do you no good. Imagine your shield of faith being cut out, but, well, we don't like this, or this is better enough, and then extra pieces added that shouldn't be there. you got to have the Bible, the King James Bible. And you got to take your feet and you got to walk. you got to put it. They're not going to come knocking on your door. Unless they're the Jehovah Witnesses. And then be ready with them. Because they're enemies of Satan. They're enemies of Satan in your neighborhood. You better take your feet and go. Tell them. Every witness. The Bible says in Mark 16. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. You got to go. Biggest question. Why do you preach on the street? Because they're not going to come to church. You got to go to them. Above all, above all, above all, taking the shield of faith. I mistake. I said breastplate. I said shield. Breastplate is is, is the covering of, of your heart and lung. The shield of faith. That's what you hold out. That's the defensive and offensive weapon. Mostly defensive. You use it to protect your body. Even though you get the breastplate or even though you get your loins covered. You still got to have that shield out there for extra strength. And that shield is probably heavy. It's probably awkward to carry. You don't, you don't want to take the gospel to everybody. You, you, you'll have people come up. Oh, no, I'm not going to give it to them. He looks mean. It looks like he's going to beat me up. But we always got to use that shield of faith. Because watch. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench... All the fiery darts of the wicked. So see, Satan's shooting at you. He's shooting fiery darts. And we are to take that faith. Boom, faith. Not water guns, not our own ability, not what we think, not with perverted but Faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, the faith in the evidence of things not seen Hebrews 11 1 faith of all the people we read about Hebrews they had their attacks and by faith they conquered got their name in that faith chapter read about them study those people see what happened in their life see how they overcame and learn with your shield to get victory and it says above all you can't walk out of your house, okay, I got my loins girded up, I got my shoes with the gospel on, I got my uh, breastplate on. All right, you can't leave the shell, shield at home. Everything we've read so far, you wear it. All right, you put it on, that's good. That shield is, you take it. It's not something you put on. You can put it down. You can leave it behind. You can forget it. You can have the armor of God and step out and leave the shield behind. Oh, forgot it. And then if you forget it or you refuse to take it, what are you going to quench yourself when those darts come flying at you? The Bible says only the shield. And notice the wicked. Satan himself. All those that follow him. They are against you. Look at all the attacks that Paul had. He's on a ship. And he says, hey, we're going to destruction. We're going to crash. But the God of heaven told me, my Savior told me, all our lives shall be spared if we stay in the boat. That's faith. That's believing. And then we go on and take the helmet of salvation. That's your head. That's what covers your head. 
salvation. So you got to be saved. You got to be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another item that's worn. So your head is covered. Your chest is covered. Your loins are covered. You are holding a shield. Again, these are defensive weapons. No one ever takes their helmet and starts swinging it or hitting anybody with it. You don't do that. That protects your brain. That protects your thoughts. You want your thoughts controlled. You put your thoughts under the same and the salvation of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's the one everybody wants. The sword of the spirit. And what is that? Which is the word of God. Everybody wants to carry a Bible. Everybody wants to have a King James Bible. But we got to have this whole armor. All of it. You can't just walk out with a Bible and expect to win a battle. And the sword is a defensive item. And it's an offensive item. You use it to attack and you can use it to block a shot. You can use it to protect yourself. Again, like the shield, it can be used for offense. It can be used for defense. You just got to know when and when and how and why and where. Because every situation that Satan will put you in will not be the same. You got to know, okay, do I use this word of God? Do I use it as an offense? Do I use it as a defense? Do I use it to poke somebody and kill them? Or do I use it to nurture somebody? To help them to grow? To help them in comfort and misery? See, the Bible can be used as... Oh, and then it can be used... Oh, I really appreciate that. You know, I was just having so much trouble on it. That, that was a good pass of scripture you gave me. I like that what you put in that card. That 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 was that really cheered me up. That made me feel a little better. I and mean, then you know, on the street, man, shut up, you're too loud. But well, you know, I'm supposed to preach the word. And sometimes the sword gets in the sheath. It belongs in the sheath when you're not using it. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is Jesus Christ. Which is the whole Word of God, which cannot be a modern Bible. A modern Bible is a piece of wet macaroni. It ain't going to do you no good. Jeremiah 48.10 1 Thessalonians 5.8 And notice so far, and there will not be no armor on your rear. You don't turn your back on the enemy. You turn your back on your enemy. Your back, which is your spinal, which can get your lungs, which can get your heart. It can get your kidneys. It can get your liver. If you turn around and put your back to Satan, you can be attacked. And you probably get one of your vital organs suffer much damage, if not death. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Now, I've added verse 18 as another piece of armor I've never seen anybody mention before. And I would say that's your knee pads. And if you've ever seen a suit of armor, it's got an extra uh, armor, extra plating, whatever you want to call it. There are above the knee and makes the knee so you can move. But it also has extra plate. You know we ought to be as army of God. You know ready to fight the devil. Carry the King James Bible. We ought to be on our knees praying. If we're not standing we ought to be kneeling. If we're not kneeling we ought to be standing. That is our position. And sometimes we're on the battlefield with Satan. And he's attacking us. And the only thing we can do is drop on our knees and say God I need help. Prayer is important. Prayer is offensive and it's also defensive item that we have of God. We can use it both ways. We can use it to help someone who, who's in trouble, someone who's in pain, someone who has a need. We can use it in a time of our need. We can use it as an emergency. We can use it when we're in battle and we're losing. We can use it in battle when we need to win. And watching. Watching. You gotta be observant 
You got to be aware. You got to be in your right mind. It said verse 18 of chapter 5, not drunk with wine. You cannot see properly and, and comprehend life if your facilities have been obstructed by alcohol. Your vision's paired. You get in an accident and they call it a DUI. You can't have, there's no cell phone here. You can't be looking down at your phone with your thumbs getting exercise while trying to fight Satan. That don't work. You got to keep your eyes forward. You got to keep your eyes awake. You got to keep them good. You got to keep them nurtured and looking. Watching there with all preser preservance and supplications for the saints. 2 Thessalonians 3 1. So you're in a battle. You're fighting Satan. This stuff is heavy. You're swinging that sword. You're moving that shield. It's rubbing against your head. It hurts. There, the darts are coming at you. You're fighting. You drop to your knees. You're praying. And you stand up. You're fighting. And then Paul says, pray for the other saints while you're all that. Wow. Don't I have to have enough attention, paying attention to what's going on in me right now? No, while you in your troubles, while you are in your battles, you better pray for somebody else. And pray for the saints. Saints are saved people. And for me, Paul, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. So Paul, even the great Paul, I've many times, I, I, I've been so ashamed. I don't always open my mouth all the time. I should when it comes to witnessing. And I look back and I say, oh, I've only done what God told me about that one person. Who knows that guy would have been damned and the blood of, of his life be upon my fingertips. And Paul says, even I need prayer to open up. Now you would think in the book of Acts how Paul would, and you wouldn't think he would have this prayer. Paul is just great. But I think this is another part of the armor of God that Paul is asking. Your mouth needs to be open at the right time. Your mouth needs to be used with boldness, with the sword, with your faith, with righteousness, with prayer, with salvation. You should be able as a soldier for Christ to stand up and boldly proclaim your stance. To make known the mystery of the gospel. Well, here's another mystery. People out there don't know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're away in the manger. And all. Okay, they've heard those carols, but they don't know what it means. They have no idea what's set forth. They don't know that Jesus saved. They don't know that you need to believe with your heart, not just say a prayer. They don't know those things. You've got to tell them while Satan's fighting you. Not to tell them. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that Satan is blind to the mind of the people while you're trying to preach to those people. Mark chapter 4 says that guy is out there sowing the seed. And Satan's the first one that shows up and starts taking the seed. And what we fail to see is that, that sower the seed. That's a great, wonderful parable. That guy is putting the seed out. But should we dress him in a farmer's overalls? Or should we put armor on that guy while he's doing his field? If I was an artist, and I know a couple of good artists, if I were to draw a picture of Mark chapter 4, that sower, I'd put him in the armor of Ephesians and 6, working a plow with the seed bag, spreading it out. Because the first thing that shows up is, it says the birds, but Jesus said those, those birds are Satan. First one that shows up for the witnessing and spreading the gospel out, his feet being prepared with the gospel, is Satan. There he is, showing up battle. It shows up when you're trying to witness, when you're trying to speak. Satan's out to get you. He does not want his people to go to heaven. He wants his people to go to hell. 
And he wants you to shut up and you better pray for boldness. Hey, you got one ministry, you pray for another ministry. I've got the street ministry, I pray for the door-to-door -door ministry. I pray for the other street corner ministries that are around. Even ministries I don't even know about. There's a man in, in Las Vegas, I pray with the work he's doing. I don't know any missionaries of Jews, but I pray that God knows one or a few. I pray for those. Meanwhile, where, where, ground, where God has me stand my ground, I have to pray to speak boldly. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. He's in jail. This is a jail ministry epistle. He's in jail. He's shackled to two guards, usually. Oh, Lord God, give me the strength to speak to one of these guys, if not both of them. Paul already said in Romans, that which I want to do, I don't do. That which I do not want to do, that I do. He's human just like us. We don't put him on a pedestal. He has his troubles too. That therein I may speak boldly again while he's in jail. So Paul is not witnessing to everybody like we think he is. He has his moments as I ought to speak. So see, Paul's a sinner. Please, guys, pray for me. Give me the, God give me the strength to use his armor, use his mouth. I failed. But that ye also may know my affairs. And how do I, Titicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord. Do you, do you know Titicus? If, if this guy came up to you in, in glory one day or at the rapture in the cloud, say, how you doing? My name is Titicus. Will you know who he is? He's a faithful minister. Will make known to you all things. So I guess Titicus is heading to Ephesus. And visit the churches. And he's going to preach. And he's going to teach there. Whom I have sent unto you. For the same purpose. That ye might know our affairs. So here's a missionary guy. He's being sent to the church. And he's going to give a report. Of what the missionary field is. So see, when you have a missionary come to your church and he tells you what's going on in the city or the, or the country he's in, that is perfectly right, biblically right. For he says, hey, listen, this is what we're doing. This is our ministry here. This is what happened in this city. This is what's going on in this church we started. This is the, what the people, this, you know, and they answer the question. You know, there's question in time. That's Bible. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that ye might know our affairs and that ye might comfort your heart. So evidently the church in Ephesus, they got some concerns about Paul. And he keeps mentioning jail. So maybe, you know, they don't, maybe they're upset because Paul's there and they think maybe he's not going to do well or whatever it is. But he's sending him to, hey, we're okay. We're doing well. Suit up that armor and let's go. Let's fight. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith. So love and faith can go together. So that breastplate, that faith, love, you got to go out there with love, the righteousness, doing right, the shield, love, use it for love. You're out there because you don't want to see people go to hell, but Satan's trying to attack you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you believe that. For God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in order for your, your shield to work with love and faith, it's got to be God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can be no other, because there be no shield. Grace be with you all, them that love our Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be to you. In sincerity, Amen. And another thing to close this passage here is he doesn't close with any names in this book either. And I don't know why this one. It, they seem to be doing well. Second Corinthians, man, he balls them out, and pff, I ain't gonna mention no name. But Ephesians, he mentions, I'm gonna send Titicus on to you, and that's it. 
Now, why there's no names mentioned in this one? It's just this showing you this, the of uh, Paul's letters. He usually sends you know a bunch of people's names and how they doing. Tell them I miss them. Tell them you know be faithful and think about this guy over here. He needs prayer. This guy over here. He's about but Ephesians and Second Corinthians so far. I believe Galatians. Let's see, Galatians didn't have any names, did he? Let me check real quick. Um, yeah, Galatians didn't have any names either. So this is another thing with with Paul's epistles. Um, 